family. Be brave for your future. Be brave for your country. Be brave. Stained glass windows, old bar stools, and back row pews. I ran to one more than the other, but I couldn't outrun you. Trying to fill up all the empty, trying to numb the pain inside, thinking you never forgive me for all those Saturday nights. But thank God for Sunday morning. Thank God for 316 and the words it read to say you bled and gave your life for me. Thank God for the choir singing and the voice seeing come back home. Saturday night looked like the end of the story. Thank God for Sunday morning. Now I Like mine, it's what you do. Yeah, somehow you bring dead things back to life. And it might look like it is over as a stone over a grave. But I've seen you move, I'm living proof. You still roll stones away. Thank God for Sunday morning, thank God for 316 and the world.
let's give him another offering of praise in this house. He is worthy. He is worthy. Amen. We know him by a thousand names. Let's sing that back to you. Sing them all back. Sing them all back to you.
You deserve every single one. You've given me a million ways to be amazed at what you've done. I am lost in wonder at all you have done. I've known you by a thousand names. I'll sing them back to you.
This says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, through prayer and thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. Studies actually tell us that our brains are unable to process gratitude and anxiousness at the same time. So what that means, church, to get rid of all that anxiety, all the things you walked in here with, everything you've been carrying around all week, what we need to do is give him thanks, Come on. Is give him praise, tell him how good he is, amen? It's one or the other, it can't be both, and that's my prayer for you today. Father God, we just come before you, Lord, and Lord, we choose to be anxious for nothing, God. We will come to you with prayer and thanksgiving. Our hearts, Lord, we are so grateful. Lord, you are our healer. You are our provider. You can do anything, God. And we stop and we say thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for healing us. God, we pray blessing and abundance on your people today. Amen. And the church says, amen. Give Jesus a praise one more time. Uh, we're so glad you're here today. If you're watching online, welcome. We're glad you're here. And if you're a guest for the first time, whether in the room, somewhere on our campus, watching online, we're glad you're here too. Fam, help me welcome our first time guest today. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us today. We're so glad that you're with us. We just want you to be a part of our family. If you're in the house, stop by our Welcome Center online or scan the QR code. We just want to get connected with you and tell you how much we love you. Absolutely. On your way down, check out the screen. Hey everyone, Pastors Matt and Holly here. We're so excited you're with us. Uh, today we are celebrating uh, 50 years that my parents have been ordained in ministry. Yes, we are so honored to take the time to celebrate 50 years that they have given of their life to kingdom ministry. 32 of those years have been served right here in this body at Crossroads Church. Some fun facts about a dad and mom when you started in the ministry in 1973, what was happening during that time. The United States in 1973 ended their involvement in the Vietnam War uh, by joining the uh, Paris Peace Accords. Secretariat became the first horse since citation in 1948 to win the Triple Crown. And Elvis broadcast his show, Aloha, from Hawaii and becomes the most watched broadcast by an entertainer. Congratulations, Cookie and Grandpa. We are so proud of you and your 50 years of ministry. We can't wait to see what God does next in your lives. And we love you so much. Congratulations, Mom and Dad. It's been a great life. We've been doing this quite some time. Uh, and as a matter of fact, my entire life. So I know it's been a long time. But uh, it's really, really cool to see how many people that you've had a positive influence on. And uh, we've had a great life together. And uh, so proud of you and love you. Yeah, Dad and Mom, thank you for showing us how to lead a family, how to lead a congregation, um, how to lead a community. And the success that we're enjoying today uh, is directly because of your love and labor and your generation, what they've done uh, for our generation. So we love you. We celebrate you today. We honor you today. Again, 50 years. That's incredible. That's a great goal for us to shoot for. We love you so much. Congratulations. Happy anniversary. Congratulations. Thank you for faithfully uh, giving your lives to the work of the ministry Amen. Uh, for 50 years of faithfulness, 32 of those years right here in Belton. And we are, on behalf of Crossroads, we just say thank you for legacy. Amen. Uh, it's a big deal. Yes. And, and for shouldering all the things that only John and I knew about, but you did it so well. Yeah. We, we honor you. We honor you for all you've done, and we love you so much. Thank you. Ooh.
Welcome to Crossroads. We are so honored you are joining us today. Please take a moment to silence your phones as we share some important things happening at CRC. If you're a guest, we want to connect with you. Please text NEW to 54244, that's NEW to 54244, and stop by our Welcome Center in the lobby for a free gift. Thank you for being here today. We have a lot of exciting things coming up at Crossroads and we want to keep you informed. If you're not receiving our midweek email, sign up now at the bottom of the homepage at crcbelton.com. To register for any of our upcoming events, you can do so under the events tab of our website. Finally, make sure you follow us on social media so you're always up to date. We invite you to partner with us in building the kingdom. To give online, simply scan the QR code on the back of the chairs, visit crcbelton.com slash donate, or you can text CRC Belton and the amount to 77977. To give in person, utilize our boxes in the back of the auditorium. The Lord is honored when we choose obedience and bring our tithe. We are so excited to announce Go Week, an opportunity to live out our mission to love Christ and serve people. We are partnering with the local organizations to provide opportunities for you to be the hands and feet of Jesus. For more information, including dates and times of our upcoming service opportunities, visit crcbelton.com events. We value family here at Crossroads. If you choose to have your children in service, we ask that you're sensitive to those around you should your little one get restless. If at any point you need to take your child out of the auditorium, feel free to take advantage of our excellent children's program or one of the live streams location on campus. Our dream team is happy to assist. Thank you for helping us maintain an interruption-free environment. We are praying blessing over you this week. Now help me welcome Pastor Matt Thrasher. Good morning. What's up, 1015? Hey, way to bring worship this morning. You guys were singing, and uh, I'm glad you did. Like singing like nobody else is watching. That's how you got to worship, right? Worship like you do in the shower. You know what I'm saying? Just like sing as loud as you can. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day, this opportunity to be in your house. Thank you what you did at 9 a.m., what you're going to do here at 1015, and coming up at 1130. You are the same God as we sing. And I pray that that song reminded some people in the room or those watching online that need the God of Jacob, that need the God of Abraham, that need the miracle or the healing or the deliverance or the salvation or whatever that is, we are calling on the same God. Lord, as they said in Acts chapter 4, we pray the same thing. Stretch out your hand and perform miracles. We want to see it in our lifetime right here, Jesus. We give you praise and glory, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. And the church says, amen. Come on, give it up for Jesus one more time. He's worthy of our praise. Um, For all the men in the house, real quick, just you're going to hear about it coming up more. But we are moving our men's breakfast back to this campus, okay? So starting this month, our men's breakfast will, if you go to Golden Corral, you'll be there by yourself. So don't go there. We'll keep telling you, but... We're all men. I'm one too. And we need to be told multiple times. And all the wives and ladies said amen. Yeah, we already knew that. Uh, it just is what it is. Uh, but we're back on campus and uh, we'll, we'll, you'll hear more about it as we come. So, again, if you're a guest for the first time, whether in the room or watching online, we're glad you're here. If you're like, wow, what kind of church is this? There's like Star Wars paraphernalia everywhere. Uh, We take every year, the month of July, we call it Summer at the Movies, and we take a particular summer or a a movie series or a particular movie, and we just kind of pull some spiritual elements out of it. So for all the Star Wars fans, you know, we're filling your tank uh, this whole month as we talk about uh, the forces with it. By the way, check out my shirt. So we have a family in church that made these for Pastor Holly and I, and they gave them to us last week, and we're like, oh, yeah, totally going to rock those. Uh, Because week one, right, we talked about the force is with us, right? We talked about the Holy Spirit. And so today, we're going to be talking about discipleship and learning. And I know some of us, we instantly tune out when we hear education, learning, discipleship, pastor, that's boring, I would disagree. 
I think learning about Jesus is pretty amazing. I don't think we can ever learn enough about him. Right? I mean, this whole thing is about Jesus. Like, what we're doing here today is about Jesus. The songs we sing are about Jesus. The messages I preach are about Jesus. If it's about us, let's just close up shop and move on. I've seen some of those churches. I've been around some of those people. I don't want to be a part of that kind of stuff. I want to be about a Jesus kind of stuff, right, where he's the center of everything, not just the center of our movement. But here's the, here's the thing. You need to know if you attend Crossroads and this is your home, baby, is that we are not a monument. We are a movement here. We're not going to stand still and build altars to things that once were. Like we celebrated my parents' day, absolutely. We will celebrate the things that God has done, but we're not camping out there. We're going to keep going, amen? Amen. So we're a movement. But yeah, this is all about Jesus, and it should be. What did we say last week, right? When our, when, when, when our lives are about us, it's a boring story. When we're the center of our life, ugh, it's ugly. It's boring. It's, it's nasty. It's, it's, it's bad all the way around. But when our lives are about Jesus, when our churches are about Jesus, when our messages and our songs, and so this, that's what this is about. This is all about Jesus. It's not about me. And it's certainly not about you. And it's not about denominations. I'm, I'm, I, theology 101, we believe that Jesus is the only son of God and is the only way to God the Father. There's not a bunch of ways to God. There's, there's just one way. It's It's Jesus. And, and, and he's made it very easy to get to God, by the way, because of what he did on the cross for us. This is, a, this is about Jesus. Everyone say Jesus. Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. Amen? There's still power in the name of Jesus. It still strikes fear in, in well, the devil doesn't have a heart, but it still strikes fear in Satan and every demon. There's power in the name of Jesus. Amen? Like when we pray his name, when we say his name, when we sing his name, there's power in the name of Jesus, church. Shout Jesus today. Woo! Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. And Satan knows, and I'm reminding you as a congregation that we need to be reminded there's power in the name of Yahweh, in Jesus. That's why we pray in Jesus' name. That's why we say it. We, we end what we pray in his name because it's in him and it's through him. That's why we exist, amen? It's not because of us. We exist because of him. Amen, church? Are you with me today, 1015? It's not about us. It's about Jesus. That's what I want this church to be known for. I want this community to look at this church and like, man, that's not a cross. That's a Jesus church. I guess we could change the name of the church to Jesus church. We could do that. I want to be known as a Jesus pastor. I want us to be those Jesus people. I want to be those people. Oh, they're those Jesus people. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am, we are. Yeah, we know who this is about. We know who's holding all this together, by the way. And it ain't us. And it ain't the government. And it ain't good thoughts and good people. It's Jesus that's keeping all of this together. It's not us. It's not denominations. It's certainly not religion. It's certainly not pastors. It is Jesus, church. It's holding this together. He is the bedrock. He is the foundation. He is the cornerstone that we built everything upon. It comes from him and it flows from him. Amen? Amen. Well, let me preach my sermon this morning. As we've done every week, we've brought some interesting facts about the Star Wars trilogy. Now, for all the Star Wars fans in the house, you know that the real Star Wars movies are episodes four, five, and six, right? The original trilogy. Uh, George Lucas did something weird in the early 2000s with the Clone Wars, and those were weird, but it got back on point. Check this out. The, the planet Dagobah in, in the, that, that we hear about in the first trilogy, it's actually named after Bodega Bay, which is where George Lucas had a ranch house, and he would frequently go to Bodega Bay, but when he was writing the script for the original movie, episode four, he changed it to Dagobah. What's interesting also about Bodega Bay, raise your hand if you've seen the movie Goonies before. Okay. So if you've seen that movie, remember in the closing scene when they've 
gotten out of the cave and they've gotten away from the people that are trying to kill them, you know, these little kids, and, and they're standing on this beach area and they see the ship kind of coming out and it's sailing now by itself. Yeah, you guys remember that part in the closing scene? That's Bodega Bay. Now you know. The more you know, right? Uh, the phrase, I have a bad feeling about this, is in every, every movie Star Wars has ever made. I thought that was interesting. I thought this was really cool. R2-D2 stands for Real 2 Dialogue 2, which in the movie American Graffiti that George Lucas also directed prior to Star Wars, it's on a can of spray paint. Yeah, it's in there. Yeah, you didn't know that, but now you do. And then last of all, the actor... Alec Guinness, who is known for playing Obi-Wan Kenobi again in the original trilogy, in his contract, he opted to for 2% of all box office ticket sales. He had no idea how much money he was going to make, but at that time, he made $95 million. More than George Lucas, by the way. <laughs> True story. Our one truth is this. What will we do with what he did? What will we do with what he did? And of course, I'm talking about Jesus. What will we do as a church with what Jesus did? So it, it seemed like through the applause and through the amening and through the, your head shaking that when I was talking about Jesus, you guys, it seemed collectively that you were on the same page with me in terms of who we believe Jesus is and, and that we believe he he was who he said he was, and he did what he said he did, or it's the greatest hoax ever. That those are the only two options. Either Jesus is the Jesus of the Gospels and, and the, what the Old Testament said about him, or it is literally the greatest hoax in human history. What we believe, obviously, at Crossroads, that he is who he said he is, and he did what he said he would do. Amen? Amen? But I told you today we're talking about discipleship and about learning and about acquiring knowledge and that we all need to be learning. Um, as adults, we need continuing education. Um, sometimes in, our, uh, in your industry or um, where, where we go as a pastor, I go to pastor conferences and we... We, we learn about continuing education in terms of what, what I do is, is my profession, as my role here. You might have continuing education. Again, and wherever you are, you have to have get so many hours. So I'm not saying that as a Christ follower, we have to log so many hours every day. I, I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about relationship. Like if you're literally like, I logged 2.2 hours a day with Jesus, check. That's cool. But were they meaningful hours or were you just logging to log hours? Um, I'll say it for people in the room, and I've said this before. When I pray, I might not pray for a long time, but I never go a long time without praying. So what you need to know about your pastor is like, I just, I'm gonna, can I spit real truth this morning? Just like rubber meets the road stuff. Like how I walk out, this is how I walk out my faith. When I get up in the morning, my wife is like, she is ready to meet with Jesus. I mean, it's like Jesus has been waiting for her to wake up. And she wakes up, and it's like rainbows and unicorns, and she's smiling and humming, and she's got 20 books and, and uh, a Bible and map colors and, uh, seriously, gospel truth. And she's got this place in her closet that she goes to, and she sits down, and her and Jesus just laugh and talk. And it's a, I'm like, I, when I get up, Jesus and I don't talk. I don't talk to anybody. And I'm, I'm not, I'm just being honest with you. It takes me a while to get warmed up in the morning. Anybody else like that or am I alone? Okay, thank you. High five, high five to all the awesome people in the room is what that says to me. Yeah, I, I just, I need to warm up to people, to animals, to Jesus even. Like I just need to, let me get going, let me get in my lane, let me get my stride. By the time I'm dressed and I'm headed to the office, Jesus and I are ready to talk. Right? You've had your cup of coffee. You've processed what's happening for the day. You're, uh, but I'm just telling you, like, in this relationship with Jesus, that's what it is. It's a relationship. And Jesus has a unique relationship with every single person in here, and it's different for everybody. And I'm just saying all that because 
I don't want you to look at me and like, oh man, pastor's probably got it all buttoned up. He's got it all together. Listen, I'm a wreck. But by the grace of God, he's holding all of this together. He's the one that makes it look good. Amen, church. It is not me. I have done my best to mess it up. And so in this relationship with Jesus, check this out. He made you, and he has a relationship picked for you and him to walk out together. And it's not like anybody else's. And the things that Jesus wants to say to you, he wants to say to you specifically. Are you with me today, church? Are you with me today, 1015? All right, amen, amen. Let's read some scripture because that's what we're supposed to do in church. In Luke chapter 13, by the way, this parable is told in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I like the way Luke tells this parable personally, but you can read it for yourself. It's it's the same parable. They just all kind of tell it a little differently. It's called the parable of the fig tree. Um, As we set this up, Luke 12 and 13, in in some ways, are kind of like the Sermon on the Mount. If you go to Luke 12 and Luke 13, and if you're reading in a red letter edition of your Bible, even if you're on the, like, digital Bible app, like NIV, you'll see it's like red, 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 red. It's just Jesus having this discourse. And he's talking about, in Luke 12, like, why he came here and what his role is here. And he's talking about them. He's looking at this early first century people, and he's telling them in many ways, listen, trials and tribulations are coming. And, and you need to be prepared for the stuff that's on its way. Church, I'm telling us, in case you didn't know, trials and tribulations are coming to our shore. Like they're, they're, they're coming to our hometown. Like there are real conversations, real battles we're going to have to be engaged in. And Jesus is just saying, listen, I love you enough, I want you to be ready. That's what this is about today. This isn't about, well, I don't want to get there just yet, but this this is about us being ready for what he's called us to do, amen? Because, right, the one truth is, what will we do with what he did? What did he do? He went to a cross to save mankind. What are we going to do with that church? That's that's a big deal, and you have to, we're going to, we're just, we'll keep unpacking that as we go. But in Luke chapter 13, Jesus He tells this parable, a man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but he did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree, and I haven't found any. Look at this. Cut it down. Why should it use up soil? Ouch. Okay. Here's what you need to know about this parable. In this parable, God the Father has come to look at his vineyard. Now, this is a judgment on the house of Israel. When Jesus is saying this, he's talking about Israel. He's talking about the Jewish people. And there is a judgment that's upon them. And so he's saying it's like God the Father has come to check on his vineyard. And Jesus, who is the caretaker of the vineyard, tells him, or he says, look, he says, you Three years, we've seen no fruit. Cut them off. Why should, why, should he have, why should this fig tree have any soil? What's interesting about judgment is, we all know this to be true, it's easy to judge other people. Yeah. Come on. Amen? We make, we do it, we, make, we judge people. We judge them the first seconds we meet them. Ladies are staring down other ladies like, I would have never wore those earrings with that pair of shoes. I don't know what she was thinking. Like, dudes are sizing up other dudes. You're like, man, if we had to fight, could I take this job? I think I can take him. I think I can do it. You know we do it. We look around. You know, it, it, we're just judging people. You judge church. You judge me. I judge you. You know, we just judge. All the time we're just casting judgment about things that we don't even know about sometimes. We, we judge people's lives uh, based on, you know, what we see on social media, which no one posts their worst stuff, do they? No. We always post our best stuff, but we're, we're, we're making judgments about people and about them. And, and when it comes to judgment, it's, it's always easier to judge someone else than to judge yourself. Because, you know, everyone else is a problem. We're, we're made of sugar, right, and unicorns and rainbows, 
But Jesus has come and he's saying, listen, I've come to cast judgment on the, on the nation of Israel, on the house of Israel. And, but there's judgment coming to America as well, church. You hear my heart today. There is judgment coming to America. And Jesus is saying, you can get ready. You can prepare yourself for the judgment that's coming. Amen, church? That's a prophetic word, and it's coming. But we as a church can prepare ourselves for the coming judgment. But he's looking at them, and he's saying, now listen, we know scripturally that Jesus' ministry while he was here on earth was three years. What does this parable say? For three years I have been coming, and every time there is no one, is, it is not bearing fruit. Again, as this is written, Jesus is talking to a Jewish audience, and he's saying the judgment comes first to the house of Israel, and then he judges everyone else as he will judge us. But I'm telling you, church, we can be ready for that judgment, and you and I are to bear fruit Amen? We're to bear good fruit. We are to be fruit bearers, images of God, of Mago Dei. How many have ever heard of the Dead Sea before? Okay, for those that are going with me in Israel, uh, here in just a just few months, we're going to be there. We're going to spend some time at the Dead Sea. I think they have a photo of it. And we're going to go there, and it's kind of really cool. We'll put on swimsuits, and we're going to... You don't swim in the Dead Sea. You float in the Dead Sea. Gospel truth. It, you literally cannot swim because of the salt content. It's, it's so thick that you, it's, it's the weirdest thing. You literally sit on top of the water. You, you can't, I guess you could drown if you flipped over and couldn't get back, but you sit on top of the water. What's interesting about the Dead Sea is, number one, it is the lowest elevation on the planet Earth. It's the lowest elevation. Number two is it's inhospitable. Nothing lives there. We're going to go, and as the tour bus gets closer and closer, the, the salt just piles up into literally hills. There's just massive salt hills there. And, and the, the sea, you're walking, when you walk into it, it you're walking on salt. You've got to wear shoes because literally it's salt rocks and big chunks under there of salt. And it's, it's inhospitable. No fish live there. Bacteria can't even live there. I mean, it can grow in our teeth and our ears, but it can't live there. It's in hospital. And last thing is, nothing flows from the Dead Sea. Part of what makes the Dead Sea its name is, one, because it's literally dead. There's nothing that can live in it. But listen to me, church, because it has no outflow. My prayer, Jesus and I have been praying over everyone this week, and I have a burden for this as your pastor today that we are not walking dead seas where we digest and we intake and we gather, we get information, information, whatever it is, we gather, gather, and there's no outflow. It's like a swamp. No one says, hey, I've got a few million dollars. I want to go build my dream home in a swamp. No, you know where the fresh body of water is, where the streams are? That's where life is found. Church, if we are going to be disciples of Christ, if we are going to be image bearers of God, if we are going to bear fruit, everyone look at the stage, look at your pastor, I want you to catch this, then we must be like streams of living water rather than dead seas, where there it comes in and it flows out. I receive and I give back. The Holy Spirit was not given to us so we can hoard him in the four walls of this metal building. The Holy Spirit comes into us and there is an outflow there's a work of the ministry. There's an anointing that should be coming out of each and every one of us. Meet me halfway this morning, 10, 15. You got to do this one more time. All right. I'm just telling you, as a Christ follower, your job and your mission isn't just knowledge acquisition. On my iPad, your phone, we have available at our fingertips more information than any other generation in history. Like, it is so easy. You don't even have to type in it. You can just say what you want, and it pulls it up. Or if your phone's like mine, it's just listening in. <laughs> Come on, somebody. And it just tell you, like, listen in again. But hear my heart today, church. If, if information solved problems, all of our problems would be solved. 
What do you want to know? You can find it right now on your phone. Every fact, every, every, anything you want to know. It, in less than a second, it's, a, it's not about information. There are a lot of Christ followers that have a lot of information. We, we know a lot about God, but we don't know God. It's almost like God is this Hollywood figure that we know facts about, but I don't care about how many facts you know about God, but do you know God? So if sermons are just me acquiring information, then I'm, I'm a bad pastor. Because when you meet the Jesus I know, there's transformation. It's not about information. It's about transformation. The book of Acts showed us this, what God can do with a small group of people who have no funding, no formal education, no denomination, no, f- no background in theology and, and missiology and, and, and have gone to the best schools to learn about the God that we're talking about today. What did the book Acts show us? Oh, and by the way, a hostile government was against them. What did they do? They turned the world upside down. And 2,000 years later, we have money, we have religion and denomination, we have formal training, uh, we, and we don't really have a hostile government against the church, we don't. Why are we not turning the world upside down? I'm just saying, come on church, are you with me today? I want Crossroads to be the place where our community is like, what is happening there? People are being saved. Lives, marriages are being restored. Sons and fathers and daughters and mothers are returning to one. Are you with me today? How many believe that with me? Like miracles. God is healing people, saving people, delivering people. Amen. There's a really good book I'm reading. I'm not telling you you need to read it. I'm just telling you this book is changing my life as we speak. It's called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And I'm doing this study just for my own personal benefit. And it comes with a workbook and a a devotional. So anyway, this is in the first few pages of the book. But when I read this, I was like, ouch. And I want to read the quote to you. They'll put it up there. But this is a book that was written by a pastor in New York. And he's talking about a gentleman in his church, um, in, his, in this gentleman's journey with Jesus. Are, are you with me? And he's writing what this gentleman said about his own personal walk with Jesus. He said, I was a Christian for 22 years, but instead of being a 22-year-old Christian, I was a one-year-old Christian 22 times. Yeah, I had the same reaction. I was like, ouch. And then I prayed a prayer for myself and for you. And I said, God, I don't want us to be a church with a bunch of one-year-old Christians who have done it 22 times year after year. Holly and I have two amazing kids. One's here. I don't get to see her that much because she lives in Austin. But we have two amazing kids. And as they were born, both of them, if you've ever had to raise children, you know what I'm talking about. As they were born... We take them to the doctor, and they poke them, and they prod them, you know, and they weigh them, and they test them from infancy up. Your pediatrician is, he or she is looking at certain, like, growth points, right? Like, hey, by this age, they should be responding this way. They should be doing this. They should be, you know, moving this way. They should be, you know, responding in certain ways. And if it's not there, your pediatrician, your doctor is like, hey, we need to research this a little more. We need to look at this a little more. Like something needs to be looked into here. They should be responding a different way. And it's no different in our walk in the Lord. Like we need to be maturing along the way. Like if 10 years from now we are the same Christian, man, we've wasted our time. We need to be cut off because we're just using up good soil. But I don't want that to be us, amen? I want us to be people who mature Jesus says this in John 15, 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, what does it say? Say it, he takes away. It says every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. That's us, church. In Matthew 13, Jesus says this, though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand. Church, that's our culture today. 
They have eyes to see, but they don't see. They have ears to hear, but they don't hear. And just so we're all clear who Jesus is speaking to here in Matthew 13, he's not talking about lost people. He's talking about those that know God, that know him. I'll close with this thought really quick. In Revelation, it begins in chapter 3. Uh, there, are, there are seven churches that are mentioned. Everyone say seven. Why seven? I don't know. Ask God. But there are seven churches mentioned. What's interesting about all these churches, number one, these were at the time real churches that in real cities. These were not like made up parable cities. These were real cities with real churches, if you will, bodies of believers, followers of the way. Because the word Christian hadn't come along yet, so they referred to themselves as followers of the way or disciples of Christ. If you're with me, say amen. amen. All right, so in all of these letters, as John is writing, he, when he starts off, he commends each church for something. He says, hey, you guys have loved well, or you gave well, or you served well. And then he goes on to say this. He goes, but I have this against you. And then he brings a charge against him. And in these, when he's writing these letters to these seven churches, he, he's echoing what Jesus is echoing. He's saying, hey, if you have an ear, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And through your pastor, that's what the Spirit is saying to the church. Like, we need to get ready. We need to be maturing into the people that God has called us to be. Amen? Hey, whose church is it? It's his church. Who will build it? He will build it. You with me, church? It's his church. He will build it. How big it is depends on him. How good it is depends on us. What will we do with what he did? Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Father, we thank you for this day. You've been so good to us. I thank you for what you did at the 9 a.m. God, what you're doing right here, what you're saying to us. Lord, you and I have been talking about your people all week. We've been praying together. We have been talking about this moment my burden that they understand it is, it is incumbent on each and every one of us to mature into the person that you've called us to be because there is a message that needs to be shared with this world and that is that Jesus still saves, he still heals, and he still delivers today. And the power of hell it stands no chance against the power of Jesus. We want to be bold Christ followers who declare the truth unashamedly who are spirit-filled and spirit-led church and people. With our heads bowed, our eyes closed, as we do every week, and if you're watching online, man, we have somebody interacting with you right now that would love to chat with you. Uh, but if you're here today, say, number one, Pastor Matt, I have never made a public declaration uh, that Jesus is the Lord of my life. In just a few moments, I'm gonna count to three, and I'm just gonna ask you if that's you right where you are, just to raise your hand, and I'm just gonna acknowledge you as I see your hands go up. Number two, if you're in the room, and maybe you haven't been in church in a long time. Maybe someone invited you. Maybe you found us online. Maybe you've been driving by and you decided to come. And in a way, you're returning to the faith or you want to reaffirm your faith today. We don't believe that you lose your salvation here. But we, we certainly do believe that we can make conscious choices that we walk away from God. We, we distance ourselves. But you say, man, Pastor, I, I want to I reaffirm my faith today. I want to. And you know what? We're going to say, welcome back. We missed you. On the count of three, that's you, either one. Just, and just raise your hand. One, two, three. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Thank you. Yeah. Wow. Amen. Anyone else? So cool. Amen. Anyone else? I don't want to rush this. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for being bold. That's awesome. I don't want to rush this moment. It's the most important thing we do. Oh, yes, gotcha. Thank you. I'm not pressuring you. I just want to give you space, give you an opportunity. Anyone else? Again, online, you can participate. Over on my left, yes, I see you. Thank you. Wow. Come on, Crossroads fam. Let's, yeah, over here, thank you. So cool. So cool. So cool. Wow. Hey, guys, look at me. You need to know what's happening here at Crossroads. This isn't happening at other churches. I'm telling you, I'm talking to my colleagues. Last, last month, between all three services, 
we've had over 20 people say yes to Jesus this last month. It's crazy, crazy. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Romans 10, 9 says, if, if we confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, the Bible says we're saved. We confess our sins to you for forgiveness, Lord. You are the only one that can forgive us. Jesus, you are the only way to God the Father. And so, Lord, I don't know the condition of their hearts and souls, these people that raise their hand, but you do because they're your children and you made them. So for those that maybe if you did that for the first time, I say welcome to the family. We're glad to have you a part. And for those that maybe are returning to the faith, I say welcome back home. We miss you. And we got a seat at the table for you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, God is so good. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hey, listen, we love you. These people up here love you too, and they would love to pray with you. If you need to do business with God, do not leave until you come up forward and let us pray with you and come in agreement with you. Sing with Tori one more time. We love you. We cannot wait to worship with you again. See you next week. And I want to sit at your feet, drink from the cup in your head, lay back against you and breathe, feel your heart beat. more than I Those who are praying or spending time with the Lord, we ask that you fellowship in the lobby or outside.